Hi, I'm back again. Um, I hope you can hear me over the air conditioning. I'm going to talk now about how I used the video I just posted on myself. I don't know if it'll help you, but it might. And if I seem pensive, it's because I am. I'm really in a state of shock about this. It's such an obvious fact that you never really learn a word, any word, without attaching value to that word. And the value you attach isn't simply what you're told. It's your own sense of it. So there's a constant mutation between whatever the word actually means, what people think it means, and what you think it means. With the upshot being that, as the atheists often say, you know, uh, this whole God thing is an invention in the head. Well, that's what I'm going to talk about. God either exists or doesn't. My attitude about his existence is a separate thing. A fork exists or it doesn't. My attitude about that fork is a different thing. A dog exists or it doesn't. My attitude about dogs is a different thing. Or that dog. Um, and what's the problem here is that the actual existence or fact of a thing and its actual nature isn't perceived by us or is perceived by us variantly, rightly or wrongly. Always more to learn, of course. But that's not the whole perception. There's a value we place on every single word we learn and then the words add up to sentences, paragraphs, ideas. And so we have a value that we place on the ideas as we're learning them, which may or may not reflect anything accurate about the facts. You see what I'm saying? God exists. It is my idea of God as he exists correct. Maybe, maybe not. Obviously, there's going to be some part of my idea of God which is wrong. Or if only wrong to the extent that I don't know all there is to know. And I'll never know all there is to know about God. That's what heaven's for. Heaven's one great big place where everybody gets to learn God more and more every day. And we're all using each other to learn him better. Okay, now that's my impression of what heaven is about. You have to evaluate that with God yourself. But that's my value. I can't see a reason to go to heaven if it's not to be with God. I see no purpose. I see no purpose in life either. But that's my value. I've said that before, so you know my bias. Now, God actually exists or not. God's character, nature, thoughts, beingness, actions, or whatever they really are. The big hickey is, do I perceive him the way he really is? And the promise of the Bible is, you can't perceive God yourself. You have to want to, number one. And number two, even if you want to, he has to enable you to do that. And that's why you are, the real you, is immaterial. That's like, you know, a similarity of devices. You know, you got your iPod, and you got your Mac, and then you got Windows. Okay, there's got to be some kind of interface to make those devices talk to each other. So the, the real you, your soul, is basically created in God's image. Therefore, God can talk to you, and you can hear him. But if you don't want to, well, then you won't. And then the next question is, when he talks to you, if you want to, what kind of value do you 
do you put on what you hear? And then the atheist is going to turn around and say, well, how do you know what you hear isn't your own hallucination? And that's a very good question. And that's the heart of what I'm making this video about. I have to assume that whatever values I got are partly wrong, definitely limited versus the reality. And how am I going to go around testing so that I can start to revalue whatever it is I think I know? See, that's why my channel is dedicated to auditing. Whatever it is I think I know, I don't know it well enough. And I might not know it at all, or I might know a false idea. So it's really imperative to continually audit whatever it is I think I know. You know, full scale. I always have to be open to the idea that God does not exist. I always have to be open to the idea that changing my belief about anything whether it's, you know, my hair or God. Because to the extent I'm not open to that, to the extent I have no doubts, even if I have no doubts, to the extent I get dogmatic and say, well, this is the way it is, then I'm arrogant and then I'm insane. Sanity is to doubt your premises all the time. I don't mean doubt like, oh, I'm not sure this is true. No, doubt like in science. Scientific doubt is where you are always stating a case. You're constantly using what evidence supports that case. But you're constantly open to the idea that maybe what you think the facts add up to, they add up to something else. Okay? That's the purpose of doubt. That's scientific doubt. Every true, true scientist constantly doubts what he knows. Okay? Constantly. It's right there side by side with the certainty. I have a great deal of certainty about what's true and untrue. And right alongside is the requirement that I be also open to an entirely different, even if antithetical, interpretation of the same facts. Now, that kind of attitude doesn't happen overnight. We all end up having some of that because what's happened to us is we grew up with a certain set of ideas and somewhere along the way, we came to recognize that the ideas we had were wrong. And we don't want to make that mistake again. So we sort of insert a new attitude of skepticism from that point forward. It usually has to be some big thing that we got wrong. We start inter inter inserting an attitude of skepticism toward every single thing we start to learn from that point forward. We, we go back to whatever it was we thought we knew. We kind of become iconoclastic and start throwing out everything. This is how atheists get started and how people turn off religion, and the, which they should turn off religion. But you don't throw out God with the religion, okay? But this is how we all get started. We get iconoclastic. We find out, you know, for example, that religion is a big pile of crap. And then we're tempted to throw God out with the bathwater. And then every single thing that we thought was true, we start to want to say it's all untrue. Start over, clean slate, be skeptical about everything, we value everything. Are you with me on that? That's a process we humans go through on, on pretty much any topic you want to name, especially God. Okay, so going through that process after you have new beliefs, or even old ones, that takes a little bit of effort. It's basically an unlearning process. It's a questioning process. 
It's a doubting process where you kind of force yourself to look at the opposite view. Now, if you've already been trained to do that, it's easier. But most of us are not trained to do that. I was. Okay? I was trained to do that basically because everybody around me had every kind of idea of God that you could name. And my family, just everybody, you know, picked and threw away ideas of God like you change your clothes. So it was easy for me to be, as it were, more skeptical and questioning about, well, what is the real truth? Because I was looking at all these people around me with all their different ideas of God. And I mean, you name it, they had it. And I'm like, well, what is the real idea of God? And some of you might remember me talking about that. At 13, I'm laying in bed, looking up at the ceiling. Which God are you? Because I was confused. I knew there was one. I've known God since I was born, practically. But which version? You know, for the atheist, it's, does God exist at all? That was not my problem. My problem was which version? Because I've known God in my head since I was a kid. It, separately from what everybody taught me. Okay, and why? Why was that true? I don't know. My big value in life from the time I was born, seems like, was that God exists. And then my mother tells me stories about how I used to be. And she'd mention God, and I'd run around the house looking for him, even looking underneath the rocking chair. You know, they, in, in, in the 1950s, I don't know if you've seen them, they had rocking chairs with, with like, bed skirts. And I'd, I'd look under the skirt. I sort of remember doing that, too. I don't know why. Why in this believer was the whole idea of God so important? I can't tell you. Just was. Okay, but that doesn't mean God exists. Just because I want to know God, or I think God's a good idea, that doesn't mean he exists. That just means I want him to. Okay, but the reverse is also true. Just because we don't want God to exist, or we don't want God to be a certain idea that we have in mind, doesn't mean he's not that. He, he doesn't exist. If I don't want God to exist, that doesn't mean he doesn't exist. If I don't want God to be the Islam God, or the Baha'i God, or the Buddhist God, actually, Buddhism doesn't have an idea of God. It's a oneness of nature. But just because I don't want those ideas doesn't mean they're not true. You see the point? You constantly have to question the very premises. And that the reason why this is the big thing I learned today. The reason why this is so hard to do, the reason why we tie up our sort of religious ideas with our identities, is that we learn them that way from the cradle. We never learn a word or a feeling apart from how we like it or dislike it. We're constantly, even from the cradle, um, choosing whether we like or dislike some feeling or some word or some sound or some idea. We're constantly choosing to like it or to dislike it, to believe it or not believe it. You can't divorce the factual learning from the values that are either partly learned or just invented by us in our own head. Like, I like, I like, um, I like liver, chicken liver. I love chicken liver. I love spinach, okay? I love romaine salad. You might hate those things. Okay? So we treat ideas, we taste them. And we like the taste or we don't. We get feelings and we like to feel the taste of the feeling or we don't. And then we assign a value to every single jot and tittle of a word, an idea, a thing, a person. And that becomes reality for us because that's what we want it to be. Okay, but how does that like fit the facts? And what makes this even harder is a lot of facts. There is no value to them. I mean, 
specifically. You know, I exist or I don't. What's the value of brain out? I don't know. But I exist. Whatever my value is, I mean, I can give you the Bible answer to that question, but let's just look at the fact of it. I exist. So if I die tomorrow, so what's the big deal? So if I were never born, so what's the big deal? I mean, technically, if there were no God at all, what would it matter? And if there is a God, well, then you have to get into the question of, well, did a God make me? And then what's the value to that God? Because that would be the ultimate reality. In other words, my reality is a subset of a bigger reality, the world. You know, well, let's do it this way. My reality is a subset of a bigger reality, the fact, the fact of my existence. The fact of my existence locally here in Houston. The fact of my existence in Texas. The fact of my existence in the United States. The fact of my existence in the world. The fact of my existence in this time zone. And when I say time zone, I mean time frame. Not 2013. Versus some other year. Versus some later year. What's the value of my existence? I don't know. I determine in my own mind what's the value to my existence, and frankly, I don't know the answer to that. The only way I can figure out anything is if I look at the Bible. Okay, so when I look at the Bible, how accurate is that? I don't know. If I don't know the value of my own existence, how do I know that what I'm reading in the Bible is accurate? How do I know that my reading it is what it actually says? You see the point? I always have to start at that sort of not knowing, presuming I don't know, even if I do know. Because if I don't start there, and technically I guess you can call that doubt, if I don't start there, then I might miss some facts or real values that my own sense of values will cloud. All right? Sorry, this is taking me so long to get to the main point. The main point is, how do I live out this doubt? Cultivating doubt. That's the title of the other video. Cultivating doubt. How do I do that? Well, there are a lot of things we got to do during the day. I like to always take the mundane approach, and I'll explain why in a minute. There are a lot of things that we do in the day that are really stupid and boring and dumb. Like, an hour ago, I made a salad. Okay? Now, when I go to do anything at this stage in my spiritual life, I hate absolutely everything. Period. You name it, I hate it. Even if I like it, I hate it. I don't want to be alive. I'd rather be dead. And it's not that, you know, it's not, my life is good. It's not bad. My life used to be bad. It's good now. But paradoxically, I don't want to be alive anymore. Now, why doesn't really matter. The point is that's where I'm coming from on it. That's my value, right, wrong, indifferent. So I basically hate doing anything. I don't care if it's nice. I don't care if it's nasty. I don't care if it's pleasant. I don't care if it's unpleasant. I just soon be dead right now. Forget it. And uh, just so that you understand, it's not a bitterness. It's that all life is intolerable to me now. It's too low. That's real important to say here to show you the mechanics of this, how do you cultivate doubt. I don't want to be alive because everything's too low. I know God, he's gorgeous, I just want to go home. Forget this, forget the body, forget the hair, forget, you know, whatever. I just, it's like, why bother? Okay? So if I could kill myself now, I would. And if I didn't know God existed, I would kill myself this second. Because I don't see any reason for being here. Okay? Period. You can talk all day about whether that's moral, right, or wrong. That's how, it's, how, I, how I want it. Okay? Now, obviously, because I know God, and because I know the Bible, and because I know what he's got in mind for me, I don't have the justification to kill myself. I have to wait for him to do it. And I wish he did it yesterday. But he isn't doing it yesterday. I'm talking now, right? Okay, so how do I go on? Well, I had to make salad. So, for me, and this is just my own personal application of doctrines of my life, 
since I hate everything, then I need to focus on what I hate, which is basically anything. So what should, should I do now? What should I do? Because if I hate everything, then whatever it is I want to do, there's nothing. So what should I do? Well, an hour ago, it was eat salad. Salad's good for you, okay? And I happen to like the taste of it, but I hate making it. Absolutely hate making it. Okay, so since I hate making it, then let's make it harder. So while I make salad, in this case romaine, I'm cutting up the, the, the you know, the, the head of lettuce to make the individual leaves, and then I run in place. This is really stupid, okay? Yes, it's okay to laugh. I run in place while picking that big romaine lettuce leaf into little bits and depositing it in the bowl. Because I hate running. Okay. I'm, I'm, since I hate everything, this is kind of how God's approaches to everything. Whatever it is you hate, he gives you more of it. I mean, that's how I'm getting the idea. This is from looking at the way he does things in scripture. If you hate something, he'll give you more of it until you stop hating it. Okay, so I want to get through that process because I hate everything. So I hate running in place and I hate making salad. So let's combine the two. Now here's the paradox. As a result of running in place, of course, my body's being benefited. As a result of eating salad, my body's being benefited. That's what I should do. When I find out at the end of it, after I've made the salad with the running in place thing, I end up being very happy I did that. Now, the other thing I do while I do that, because I can't stand doing it, I have to live on a Bible verse in order to do anything in life, whether it's take a shower, write an email, make a salad. The Bible verse I live on the most is Isaiah 54, 1. And particularly one clause in that verse, which is, What's a halilo hala? Which is basically God saying to creation, okay, at the, the root cosmic meaning of what he's saying there is I'm going to make good on everything, even, in this case, running in place while you take that big romaine lettuce leaf and you tear it off into lots of little pieces in a ball. So I'm living on the promise that God's going to make good on this activity. I hate living. God's going to make good on my breathing. God's going to make good on tearing up this stupid romaine lettuce leaf. God's going to make good on my running in place. God's going to make good on eating it. Even if I like the taste, I don't like it enough to eat it. See how, how cute that is? I am literally unlearning an attitude by confronting it. Okay, you hate brain out. You hate, you know, eating and living. So now you've got to do more of it. And the thing I hate the most is anything slow, small, low, and slow. Anything menial. You know, I love studying Bible the most. So the only way I'm, I get to study Bible now, this wasn't true for the last 10 years. He, he switched it. The only way I get to study Bible now is by doing something else, and then I have to think the Bible while I'm doing it. And that's like a little Bible class. There's two kinds of Bible class in life. The kind where you sit on your pastor, or as a result of sitting on your pastor and learning, you actually look at the Bible and study it. And the second kind is to be doing whatever you're doing and applying Bible to what you're doing. Yeah, well, that's my Bible class main form of it. So I have to be, I have to be doing stuff and then applying Bible to it. And the verse I apply is Isaiah 54:1. God's making good on the stupid thing that I got to do. So I'm taking what I hate and unlearning the value of hating it by applying Bible to it and doing more of what I hate, making it harder. And then at the end, it's somehow, and I can't explain this. Well, I can, but I have to use Bible to explain it. At the end of it, I'm much more satisfied than if I didn't do it that way. 
I mean, I could have made the salad without that kind of thinking and attitude and purpose. But see, now it wasn't just making a salad, it was learning Bible. Now it wasn't just making a salad, it was applying Bible. And I'm actually more satisfied by the eating because it wasn't just eating. It was learning scripture, which is the one thing I like in life. It's the only reason I like breathing is it gives me another opportunity to study scripture. Okay, but the way I'm supposed to study it is this physical kind of way. Yeah, mostly. You know, I still got the hour a day where you can listen to a teacher or read the scripture itself. But it's mostly physical for the other 23. See how that works? Now, there is a Bible verse that tells you the same thing. It's actually the verse about how the cross got done. Isaiah 53, 10 through 12. Father is imputing, stabbing Christ with our sins. Isaiah 53, 5, you've heard me say that a lot. Okay, that's the Hebrew for him, javelin stabbing us with our sins. With him javelin stabbing Christ with our sins. Isaiah 53, 11, 10 is the contract to make sons. We are the fruit, not what we do. And Isaiah 53, 11 is Yire, Yizba. He sees while he's being stabbed. He sees those sons being made. He is satisfied. Greek, uh, Hebrew word there is Sabeah. The actual, vocab, the actual word in the verse is Yizba. The, the Hebrew word for that is sabeh in vocabulary form. And it means to be satisfied by eating a good meal. And Isaiah 54, 1 is the result of that good meal. God making good on everything. That's the immediate context of Isaiah 54, 1. Is that the cross gives birth to the sterile. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm with that. Okay, because to me everything's sterile. I hate it all. Okay, so what's a halil okala? Shout for joy, you who never bore kids. For more are the children of the desolated one, the shamed one, meaning Christ, than her who is legally married, the religious crowd, says the Lord. Peace out.